I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Namrata Goswami, an independent scholar on international relations and subject matter expert with the Futures Laboratory. She's currently working on a new book focused on China's grand strategy and notions of territoriality, and joins us to discuss the current state of China's relations with Taiwan. So Namrata, welcome back. Our focus today is starting out with Air Force General Mike Minahan's prediction of a U.S. war with China by 2025. So let me start by asking, what are your thoughts on how likely this is overall? Sure. Uh, thank you, Tim, for having me back. As always, it's a great pleasure. So uh, when I think of that particular uh, statement, as well as the memo that he supposedly passed around with uh, Air Force Mobility Command, I think uh, what is strategically interesting from that particular memo where you think about hypothetical scenarios, right? So obviously he's talking about uh, likelihood in case this, this ends in a war by 2025. So in my perspective, it is always good to plan and to strategically game out what could be possible, right? So given the fact that there are elections happening in Taiwan, uh, and President Tsai, who is uh, very much, uh, she's a, she, she wants a separate identity for Taiwan. But what happens if there is a completely pro-independent move that happens in 2024 within Taiwan, right? And so uh, if, I, if I locate this entire uh, conversation uh, within the context of what President Xi Jinping has said, including in the 20th Party Congress, uh, which he, in which actually he uh, used the word Taiwan, I counted it about 30 times, which is a lot of stress on Taiwan, right? And so while the focus of his speech was that they are going to uh, peacefully integrate Taiwan into the mainland, what was interesting and, and actually quite revealing in President Xi's speech is that he talked about Taiwan as Chinese, China's Taiwan, as citizens of Taiwan, as Chinese citizens, and the fact that in case there are outside forces that support Taiwan becoming independent, uh, China will of course utilize force, right? Mm. And so given the fact that there are elections happening in the US, there's election happening in Taiwan, uh, the strategic likelihood of a escalation in conflict is always possible, right? And so I wouldn't say that it would uh, like General Manahem said, like it would be a complete war where you have the two countries uh, uh, in a war situation. And by war, you mean a systemic level war because these are two great powers that might not play out. But the possibility of escalation, the possibility of China increasing their military demonstration in the Taiwan Straits, the possibility of more aggressive assertion, these are all likely. And these are something that the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Space Force should all plan for and game for. Yeah. Well, there has been so much change in, I mean, just the, the geopolitical climate, just everything, right? The entire world, even since the last time we talked. And that's why I am so grateful for your time today. I, I am so appreciative for you, you know, just sharing these insights with us. I mean, for instance, um, so China's president Xi Jinping recently won an unprecedented third term in office. And from what Admiral Philip Davidson told the arm, the Senate Armed Services Committee in 2021, this is a couple of years ago, Taiwan is clearly one of China's ambitions, right? So it, it seems from everything I've seen, uh, Jinping feels motivated, and I believe China has made that relatively clear, that they want to retake Taiwan. They want to reintegrate that, right, into the larger Chinese nation, Um you know, the, the question is really if he's in a position to attempt it. Do you think that they're in that position? Oh, yeah, they are. Because uh, if you look at their force modernization, it is happening across different scale, right? It's not just happening in terms of technology development, including capability in space, uh, capability in projecting power in the Taiwan Straits, in the oceans, uh, the military in terms of army, and also amphibious operations, which will be one of the major operations in Taiwan. Uh, I think uh, if China wants to actually take over Taiwan, say, next year, they do have the capability to do it. I think that's not what the question is. The question is, what do they themselves prefer? Right. So if you think about how President Xi Jinping is, uh, so what... Uh, 
uh, Admiral uh, Philip Davidson said that by 2021, which was when he testified in 2021, that such a scenario is likely in the next two years. In my strategic estimation, that has been China signaling every time they give a speech, right? And so I think we don't take them seriously because when they argue, especially at the highest level at the National Party Congress, that Taiwan is an inalienable part of China, they take the example of how Hong Kong has been integrated with the national security law. Taiwan is located at a very similar kind of conceptualization, right? And so they're very serious when they point out that force is also on the table. Right, in case there is escalation of independent rhetoric and support by external actor. So I think uh, if China wants to do it today or tomorrow, they have the capability to carry out uh, operation in Taiwan. Now, my answer to that would also be qualified by saying that, but do they want that, right? Because yeah. after all, they are also dependent on import for their economy. They have COVID problems today. Uh, and so to escalate a conflict in the Indo-Pacific, especially around Taiwan and the South China Sea, may not be to their advantage, right? So they would rather have it in peacefully integrate through economic collaboration and more and more coming together. But force is always on the table and always a possibility. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, and you've touched on several things there that I want to come back to. But first, I want to get into General Minahan's prediction of war. So this was in a memo to the people under his command in the Air Mobility Command, the officers that he's in charge of. And he cited the upcoming elections in the U.S. and Taiwan, which you mentioned a moment ago, as a, quote unquote, distraction that China will capitalize on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, regular normal elections, I don't think would have any kind of impact on our force readiness but reading between the lines i kind of wondered if he was concerned about a heated political race right like we saw with trump and biden in the 2020 election you know and if that happened do you think that that something along those lines might affect u.s military readiness at all I mean, for General Menahan to actually put out a memo like that is a uh, strategic uh, signaling, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, he is the uh, he leads the uh, Air Mobility Command, and there are some who argue that the Air Mobility Command is not the one that does that kind of fighting. They're more logistics, right? But I would argue that they are part of the force multiplier. And logistics form a very critical part of it. You do not know when you're going to be called into a conflict like that, right? So I think to prepare for a likelihood of a conflict is not war, it's preparation, right? And a military, no matter what service you are, have to be prepared, right? There was some language, I think, that, that, that they were created some kind of issue about that. But I think the point is that in his contextualization of elections and uh, the possibility of escalation in the Taiwan scenario, is very likely, right? So in case there is, as I said, movements within Taiwan for independence, and this happened earlier during George W. Bush's tenure, when in 2004, Taiwan independent forces were very strong and George Bush actually had to reiterate that US believes in one China policy, right? And so to de-escalate the conflict. So if you have a very heated race here, you have a push for more assertive policy towards China vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, uh, you could see an escalation in conflict or an escalation even in strategic rhetoric in the Taiwan uh, scenario. It's very likely it has happened before and could repeat itself again. Mm. Well, so Michael McCall, the new chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the U.S. House of Representatives, he agreed with Minahan's assessment. But uh, Representative Adam Smith, the top Democrat on the House Armed Services Committee, disagreed and called it highly unlikely. Uh, do you have any thoughts on why different lawmakers might hold such completely different perspectives on this? It's political as well, but it's also diplomatic posturing, right? So, uh, I mean, China is such an integral part of the world economy. Uh, Taiwan, as you know, is one of the major manufacturers of semiconductors. So also within the U.S., uh, they want to give the impression to China that this is not the Biden administration's policy or this is not what the U.S. is wanting to actually U.S. Do not, does not war a systemic war as yet. Right. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. diplomacy should be the way forward. Uh, issues like Taiwan can be resolved through diplomatic means, right? So in some sense, uh, mixed strategic messaging that 
uh, this is one general putting out a statement and if some senators or congressmen support it does not mean that this is the whole consensus, right? In a way that is not a bad thing to happen. It's actually an important way to also uh, demonstrate not just to China, but to the world that there is ground for very strong diplomacy. But it what, what it also does is that it also signals to China that they also have to factor in the fact that there are divergent perspective and uh, negotiation and diplomacy might not be the only way forward. And that there is serious thinking within the United States that in case there is escalation from China's side on the Taiwan issue, the US does have the resolve to respond. So I think it's not a bad thing to have divergent perspectives. Yeah. Well, so let's touch on Ukraine. Are China and Russia the new Axis powers? And does China view the war in Ukraine as an opportunity for the territorial acquisition of Taiwan? I think for China, the entire issue of Ukraine is a great uh, learning experience, right? One, it tells China that it's uh, not a US-led hegemonic world order uh, uh, today, right? So in their strategic, so this is why I think uh, it's really critical we discuss this. So uh, I think the strategic assumption of Chinese uh, policy elites is that the very fact that Russia went ahead and intervened in Ukraine tells you that the US does not have the level of influence to actually ensure that such activities do not happen, right? And so in their estimation, they do not see the Russian uh, intervention as a major global turning point, but what they actually see it, uh, it as that, okay, this can give us an example of what could be the possible reactions, supply chain, if what kind of weaponry the US will actually support in case uh, China escalates a conflict in Taiwan, right? And I think Russia is a great test study because Russia is also a nuclear weapon state, very similar to China, right? And has more or less similar uh, strategic postures. So given that uh, China actually views this particular uh, Ukraine situation as a great learning experience and will utilize it in case they want to take over Taiwan in the future, because they have said that they do have force on the table. It's their own policy statements. Okay, okay. Well, the Washington Times recently published an op-ed piece by Peter Morici comparing Russia and China's relationship today to Germany and Japan in the 1930s. And that was why I asked the earlier question. So from what I understand, um, you know, Russia and China are not exactly allies, but China is supporting Russia in several ways, for instance, by purchasing gas, fuel, uh oil, things along those lines, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you might not have the same kind of 1930s relationship that you just spoke about and not alliance structures, right? But uh, without China's implicit support to the Russian intervention, uh, the argument they make that there is legitimacy on the Russian side. But more importantly, if uh, Russia did not have a lifeline in China where they're actually buying uh, Russian oil, ensuring that the economy still continues to be uh, capable of sustaining that kind of uh, uh, you know, possibility. I think Russian President Putin would have thought several times, right? And so, and that is why even in the strategic signaling just before the intervention uh, on 24th of February last year, uh, Putin actually got the implicit support from uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping, right, when they met uh, in Beijing. And if you look at China's postures at the United Nations, they have been very clear in either uh, voting against or abstaining from any kind of resolution that condemns the Russian intervention because they do not want to set a precedent for their own likely intervention in Taiwan, right? And so you can see that... Uh, there is a strong strategic convergence between China and Russia in uh, regard to Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it is it is interesting. And you know, so, I mean, presumably China's goal is to take Taiwan without going to war with the U.S., right? I mean, they would want to just basically get in and out and, you know, and retake that territory, reintegrate it into the Chinese mainland and, and not provoke a larger conflict. And so what I was wondering was if our existing commitment to supporting Ukraine basically distracts us, maybe weakens us in terms of, you know, having the ammunition and other supplies. We're sending all that stuff to Ukraine right now. I'm wondering... 
if they did move on Taiwan, do you think that the U.S. might decide simply not to step up and do anything? I mean, if you look at the 1979 U.S.-Taiwan uh, agreement, right? As far as that agreement, the U.S., uh, it's not that the U.S. Uh, is obligated to come to the defense of Taiwan, meaning use U.S. troops, but the U.S., does commit to uh, uh, send supplies like tanks, uh, fighter planes, right? And so in that contextualization, to be caught up in a two-front conflict with two yeah. nuclear weapon states could be an extremely limiting factor, right? First of all, you have only this much that you can actually send out in, time, in terms of supply. And China and both Russia knows that, right? And don't forget, they are major powers in the system. They are not small nations that do not have the capability to sustain this conflict for a long time. Second, geopolitics, by which I mean the impact of geography on politics always comes in, right? So Russia is right across the border from Ukraine. Taiwan is very close to China. Visa, and, and if you look at it vis-a-vis -vis the US, the US actually has to do these long uh, missions to actually supply. They might have bases there, but you still have to supply. You still have to ensure that you are actually there, right? And so I would argue that caught up in a two-front conflict of having to supply two different militaries, sustain financial commitments, uh, and have to navigate the fact that these are two nuclear weapon states with very advanced space capabilities would limit U.S. response to Taiwan in case the Russian uh, intervention continues, say, by 2025, which is a long time from today, right? Three years means exhaustion of your financial capability as well. And so that would limit U.S. response, in my estimation. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that inspired this whole thing, and again, I can't thank you enough for joining me today, but I did an interview with Brigadier General Jeffrey Weiss, and he made a comparison in terms of what's going on in Ukraine. He was saying that in terms of the conflict itself, it's very reminiscent of World War One, right? Mm -hmm. And as I started to think about that, I was thinking about the geopolitical, the larger geopolitical picture. And I said, you know, in, in that larger context, it almost reminds me more of World War Two, right? You have you have Russia and China. They're they're coupled together. They're kind of uh, again in a, in a way almost like these Axis powers, where they have their own ambitions. They've got their own goals and their own desires, but they're they're kind of uh, what would you call it? fair weather friends, I guess, in that sense. You know, there's some support. There's also some rivalry, and so it's it, there's a lot of uncertainty there. But as you've mentioned, Ukraine is right on Russia's doorstep. Um, you know, Ch Taiwan is right on Taiwan on China's doorstep. Now, NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg has said that China is learning from Putin's war in Ukraine, and he may apply those lessons in his own territorial ambitions. So, this is something you know, even at the highest levels of NATO, they're looking at. And his concern was that China may look at Russia's capture of the Donbass to inspire taking Taiwan. Um, I, I, do you think that they're actively looking at that and taking lessons from it? Yeah, I think one of the lessons that China has probably learned, uh, including in its own operations in Taiwan, is to uh, ensure that there is support from within Taiwan, right? So in the Donbass case, uh, Russia took advantage of the fact that there are a large number of Russian-speaking population that feel affiliated with Russia, right? And yeah. so because of that, when Russian military moved in, uh, it was very... Uh, it was not very difficult to Russia for Russia to engage in this concept called hybrid warfare, right? Where you first create a situation where you showcase to the world that here is a region that actually is Russian speaking, was uh, targeted by Ukrainian uh, military, was looked at as a minority, a second class citizen. So we are what we are doing is only liberating them, right? So in a sense, China would have learned lessons and would also try to uh, bring about very similar operations within Taiwan, right? So because if you listen to the speech that President Xi Jinping gave, he actually gives a lot of insight into how they might operate, right? Vis-a-vis -a, -vis a lesson that uh, we think they might have learned from Russia. One is that he talked about our fellow compatriots in Taiwan. Do not lose heart. We are blood brothers and sisters, right? We will always be there to support you, which means that they do have these operations ongoing in Taiwan, right? To create this mixed situation where there would be some uh, who might actually support 
uh, integration with China. And they would use that as a legitimizing factor. I think the second lesson that they would have learned is that once you are close to a particular theater of operation, you can actually wait patiently and carry on with a strategy of exhaustion, right? Mm -hmm. So you might have uh, the 150,000 Taiwanese troops fighting a very large Chinese military in case they're able to get there uh, and a Navy, but China does not need to have a quick quick exit, exit strategy, right? What they can do is they can continue this particular uh, you know, intervention for a very long time, uh, waiting uh, for the time where the West would get exhausted, right? And given the fact of what has happened in Afghanistan or Iraq or Vietnam, they would take lessons from that, right? And so, uh, and so with Russia too, the Russian intervention in Donbas has been in the making since 2000, right? It's a long uh, strategy. And now I suspect it, it's going to be a strategy of exhaustion from the Russian side as well, right? So yeah, they have learned lessons from Donbas, but also have used their own strategic thinking in this regard. Yeah. Well, now, so let me touch on deterrence, you know, because in the South Pacific, I mean, Bloomberg has written that Australia is preparing for possible war with China. Japan is shifting to war footing as well. So even if the United States itself is, quote unquote, distracted by either elections or, you know, the Ukraine conflict, would those other nations be enough to deter China, do you think? I mean, without the U.S. participating, it's going to be difficult, Right. So Japan depends on the U.S. nuclear umbrella. Australia does not have nuclear weapons, as far as I know. Right. And so and their space capability. Japan is a very highly advanced space faring nation with capability. But Australia is only starting. Right. Yeah. And and uh, if you think about an Australian uh, military capability vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, Australia is pretty advanced uh, in terms of its military defense capability, but depends on the alliance structure with US, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what they can accomplish is different though. What both countries can accomplish is that they can uh, come together to uh, create that policy narrative that showcases this as an illegitimate intervention, right? And can highlight the voices of Taiwani, uh, Taiwanese uh, citizens as to what they want. Uh, Japan can offer logistic support, so can Australia, right, in terms of any kind of supply chain to the conflict. So that's where their role comes in. And today, actually, what is fascinating is that Japan, under the, uh, you know, leadership of former, uh, you know, leader Shinzo Abe, actually recognized this uh, uh, possibility and had created the quadrilateral security dialogue, right, where India is also a partner for a very free Indo-Pacific. And so those are the kind of uh, response mechanisms I see Australia and Japan actually engaging in. And actually, uh, it's interesting you asked me this question. I was recently in Australia, and there is a growing concern about China's uh, capability to do exactly that in Taiwan. Yeah. Well, and thank you for mentioning India. Actually, I was going to ask about that. And I think when I think of India, it, it the impression that I've had is that they are focused primarily on their own security. But from what you're saying, it sounds like they're playing a larger role in regional security as well. Yeah. So India is a very interesting case, right? Especially when you think about Taiwan. So if you, th if you are an Indian strategic thinker, you would actually utilize the Taiwan case to actually put pressure on China to recognize some of the areas that China claims as theirs. For example, Arunachal Pradesh in Northeast India that China claims, it's a state which is about 90,000 square kilometers of territory, about 36,000 miles. It's a huge state and also some areas in the Northwest border of India. So uh, an Indian strategic thinker would argue that for China to pressurize India to accept the one China principle, India should pressurize China then to accept those territories as part of India, right? And India has all the strategic incentive to support Taiwan remaining as it is, right, in its current status. And in fact, uh, when you listen to the uh, response uh, to the escalation in rhetoric when Nancy Pelosi was visiting Taiwan, uh, the Indian external affairs minister put out a statement saying that India will not support any unilateral change in the status of Taiwan, right? Ah, okay. and, so, and, and India did not mention the one China principle. They neither said they are for or against, which itself is a way of showcasing, showcasing their uh, strategic move, right? But I would argue that uh, 
India's policy vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan today also takes into account the fact that uh, they have a disputed border with China and, and also because of the difference in power and military capability, including nuclear weapons, India is a little wary because after all, uh, India has a history of conflicts with China where China has come out and defeated India, right? That mentality is still there. And secondly, India has about $100 billion of trade with China, whereas with Taiwan, it's about 7 billion. So that also factors in into the entire assessment of how would they respond, right? So there are calls that India should get more political, India should be more pro-Taiwan, but then that reality also factors into India's assessment. Having said that, I will end by saying that India is a member of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue and has signed a vision for a free Indo-Pacific, right? And so uh, in that context, it is in India's interest to ensure that Taiwan remains in its current form and support that kind of political democratic existence. And so I don't think India would support a, a forced unilateral uh, integration of Taiwan with China. Yeah, yeah. It, well, and you're touching on a few X factors, you know, as, as I guess I would call them. So one of those, you mentioned this a few moments ago, was COVID. That might be a possible deterrent. From what I understand, the protest last year led to a relaxation of China's uh, zero COVID policy. And so they are struggling with a resurgence in COVID to some degree. Um, you know, there's there's also a process of economic decoupling that the CHIPS Act here in the United States, and I believe the FABS Act also, I'm not sure if that passed, but definitely the CHIPS Act, um, you know, those are starting to move semiconductors back to the United States. And I know that many manufacturers have also been moving them to other nations as well, other nations in Asia. And there's been talk about South America. So, you know, there are all of these uncertainties that play into this. So it, it'll be interesting to see where this goes. Yeah, because uh, the resurgence of COVID is a reality in China, and they have put out data now, which uh, is available. And so that's one factor. The second factor is what you mentioned, uh, chips and supply chain, right, and semiconductors. So even India recognizes this, right? So an escalation in conflict would mean that India's own uh, import of chips and, and semiconductors from Taiwan gets affected, right? Or that entire area, because that is where India depends for import of many of its uh, very critical uh, minerals, right? And so India is actually uh, trying to see if Foxconn can set up manufacturing units in India, right? So, and, and Foxconn actually has shown interest. Of course, India, as I said, will always uh, balance that with the entire uh, strategic uh, capability of China to put influence. So uh, that would play in, but I would not give it as much credence as you hear in the West, right? Mm. So COVID did not stop China from escalating at the highest levels of COVID in the 20, in 2020, 2019, 2020, that did not stop uh, China from modernizing its military, did not stop any of their space launches, did not stop their rhetoric and their aggressive assertive posturing on Taiwan and their resolve that in case uh, there is a move of Taiwan towards independence, China was very clear. They did a lot of exercises that showed that they were extremely serious when it came to uh, integrating Taiwan. And, and don't forget, President Xi has now come up with this concept called national rejuvenation and, uh, and uh, comprehensive power of the Chinese nation. And Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau are seen as critical parts of it, right? So, uh, I would not think COVID would have the impact that people think it would have in terms of uh, China's policy towards Taiwan. Absolutely. So Namrata, thank you again so much for your time today. Thank you so much for returning and just sharing all of this insights, analysis, and knowledge. I, I can't thank you enough for your subject matter expertise on this. Uh, let me close by asking, where can people learn more about your work, your current work, and I should also ask, are there any telltale indicators that we should look for in the headlines that say that China may be preparing to make some kind of a move in terms of territorial acquisition that might touch off this U.S.-China war that General Minahan was concerned about? Yeah, I think what uh, General Minahan had said, especially the year that he has cited, right, 2025, I think 
uh, there is a criticality to it, as I said, because of the election. So what I think we should look out for is what is Chinese military writing saying about it, right? So one way to understand China's, uh, we know what the US position is, right? That it will respond in some manner uh, if that escalation of conflict happens, including the Biden administration has made that clear, right? And so, and General Menahem's point that this could happen in the next two years as a hypothetical scenario needs to be factored in as well, because escalation could happen anytime. We need to be prepared for it. The hope is that this is not going to happen because these are nuclear weapon states, uh, supply chains, uh, vital supplies of container ships get affected, right? Because the uh, Pacific Ocean is a huge uh, yeah. source of the trade that we depend on. But uh, I would say PLA daily analysis, uh, not very difficult to find. If you go to their Chinese website, you can find and you can translate that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Academy of Military Sciences writings on how they are preparing their forces. I think the most telltale sign is to see what kind of exercises are they doing. And they cannot hide that because that is seen and visible, right? So are they modernizing their uh, Navy? Are they modernizing their small boat or smaller uh, you know, capability in terms of amphibious operations? Are they uh, improving their missile tracking and deployment capability, right? What is their doctrine? So is it a defense doctrine or is it getting more and more offensive? So mm -hmm. this will give you very clear signs of what is to come in the next uh, two to three years. Wonderful. Namrata, thank you again so much for your time today. Thank you, Tim, for having me. As always, a great conversation.